we saw passed in Missouri the other day is an indicator not just of Missouri, but of public opinion across the country. We're very, very pleased to have the Lieutenant Governor of Missouri with us, Peter Kinder. Again, you have his biography in front of you. Uh, the fact that he's an Eagle Scout jumps off the page to me. And he's one of you. He served in the Missouri Senate. He was a president pro tem of the Missouri Senate. And uh, so he knows how things work in the legislature, legislative branch. He knows how things work in the executive branch. Please come tell us, Lieutenant Governor Kinder, about the exciting things going on in your state. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What an honor it is to be here with these two great leaders from the halls of Congress and who have been true to their commitment through the years. And I don't know about you, but I wish I had had him as a high school government teacher. <laughs> How many of you heard Governor Perry's remarks yesterday at, at lunch? One, one little, might have been almost a throwaway line from his fine address uh, stuck, stuck out for me, and that was, uh, for those of you who know your Bible and your Old Testament, a, a self-conscious evocation of the book of Esther, where he said, for such a time as this. And that is what I think about when I think about the Tenth Amendment and this great cause that these two distinguished members of Congress have evoked for us. And this fact that we have an overflow crowd in this room that you noted would not have been this, the case a few years ago. Surely this battle and our, and our part in it is just the right thing for such a time as this. And I don't know about you, but over the last 18 months with the radical agenda being pursued in Washington, D.C. and enacted into law, I've had many defining moments. For us in Missouri, there was a a major moment of definition, and Fox News, God bless them, were kind enough to transmit it to the world live. I was in my Capitol office a year ago this month, and it was the month of the town hall meetings, remember, across the country. Uh, the beginning with the Tea Party movement of what instapundit blogger Glenn Reynolds at the University of Tennessee has called the fourth great American awakening, which I think is part of what we're we're experiencing here. And the town hall meeting in question was in the state of Missouri in a community college in Hillsborough in Jefferson County just south of St. Louis being conducted by our junior senator Claire McCaskill. And she was getting the book thrown at her by one irate cons constituent after another who had their pocket constitution in their hand, who were citing the Tenth Amendment, who had read the bill Okay, who had taken the trouble to download the bill in whatever ghastly iteration it was in that day and were citing to her provisions and clearly had a better mastery of it as they did of the Constitution than did she. And in total exasperation, talking to this one Marine who was about the 12th such person to confront her, she erupted in a high-pitched voice and said, What's wrong? Don't you all trust us? <laughs> now, my fellow state leaders, the answer to Claire McCaskill's question was not supplied by her, that, by anyone else that day. It was supplied by James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and the other framers of the Constitution. In Jefferson's words, trust no man, we will bind you down with the chains of the Constitution. And foremost among those change, of course, is the Tenth Amendment. And, um, you know, that also goes back to the book of Proverbs where it says, put not your trust in princes. Uh, we don't trust anyone with this unlimited power. We seek to bind them down with the chains of the Constitution. And I'm indebted to uh, my Lieutenant Governor colleague, from Louisiana, I could never hope to be as entertaining a speaker as he. You heard him this morning. He is a true, honest-to-goodness, coon-ass Cajun from Lafayette. And I, I had the honor of meeting him for the first time last week in Biloxi, just a week ago, and we hit it off. And from him, I stole a line fair and square. Uh, 
he was referring to LSU winning the national championship. And I stole this line and used it night before last on Greta Van Susteren when she had me on to discuss the Missouri returns on the referendum on Prop C. And I said, didn't we put an awesome can of whooping on Obamacare in Missouri? <laughs> now, you have been before audiences and speaking, and you know that it's good to get a round of applause like that. But let me tell you who really deserves the round of applause, because they're in this room. I begin with the Speaker of the Missouri House, Ron Richards, standing in the back in the Navy shirt. Ron. <laughs> I'll proceed on to the House sponsor, Representative Tim Jones, right over here. Tim Jones. And, and to the gallant, tireless Senate sponsor, Senator Jane Cunningham, over there. On the, on the Will every member of the Missouri House and Senate who's with us today please stand up for a round of applause? Because you all worked hard to make this. <laughs> Folks, these, perp these people worked before we went into session in January through the winter spring session that ended May 14th uh, to put this bill uh, before the people in the first in the nation referendum on this proposition, the Health Care Freedom Act. We were not the first to pass the bill. I believe Virginia was signed into law by Governor McDonald in, in March, or maybe Arizona. Uh, I know you, you two states were in the vanguard. We decided to put this to a referendum. One of the good things about the referendum was that it bypassed the governor who had derided the measure and criticized it and sneered at it and laughed at it. And so he had no part in it. It went straight to a vote of the people. Now, what was the correlation of forces, as military strategists say, in this battle? Well, we were outspent about five to one. There was no significant fundraising that amounted to anything on the pro side. I think it was seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars and in a statewide race in Missouri, that's nothing. The Missouri Hospital Association, which seems to have been offended when I uh, suggested uh, to somebody in the news media this week that they had been bought off by the income stream, I said, my friends at the Missouri Hospital Association uh, <laughs> spent at least 400, probably closer to half a million dollars against it. So it was, it was around five to one, maybe better. And, uh, uh, but we conducted, uh, we donned our black pajamas and conducted a guerrilla campaign with the people and got the word out. We used the social media, stuff I didn't know about a little over a year ago, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, we had yard signs and we had grassroots activists who went out on busy street corners in St. Louis and all over the state with pro yes on Prop C signs. And the voters got it. And I told Greta Van Susteren two nights ago that an F-5 tornado set down in Missouri and swept through all 114 counties, and we had a 71.4 percent majority for Proposition C. Now, now comes those who, who deride the effort, as they have all along. By the way, I think they have a logical fallacy, Congressman, in their argument. If the effort was meaningless under the Supremacy Clause and of no effect and it was a nullity and a dead letter, why was it worth trying to beat? <laughs> of course, they're, they never answer that. But now they come to say it's of no effect. If you read the New York Times, they quoted somebody saying it's of no effect. Some of these people are the same folks, the same left-wing law professors who parade on the cable shows saying that the lawsuits springing up across this country are frivolous, that they lack standing, that there is no legal ripeness, 
and on and on and on in an attempt to laugh them off as, as frivolous and without merit. But one by one, those arguments are being shot down, aren't they? And from the great Commonwealth of Virginia, we had Judge Hudson's opinion on Monday of this week, even before the good news in my home state, that he, in a well-reasoned, tightly written 32-page opinion, he denied the federal government's motion to dismiss Attorney General Cuccinelli's case and said this will go to the full hearing. And because, because of the profound Tenth Amendment and other constitutional issues implicated in that lawsuit. Uh, he, he pointed out, Judge Hudson did, uh, that nothing like this has ever been litigated. Nothing like this has ever been attempted by the federal government. And if we concede this principle, that under the Interstate Commerce Clause or the taxing power or anything else they're using to try to justify it this week, the federal government can do this individual mandate. Then limited constitutional government, any vestige of it is gone and the game is over. We will wake up someday, I've been suggesting, and, and, and read that the government has decreed that you may not buy a Ford, a, a Toyota, or a, or a Mitsubishi, and you may buy only a Government Motors or a Chrysler. And people laugh and say, well, that would never happen, but look at the fantastic series of events over the last 18 months, that <coughs> all of which had never been contemplated before and are now coming to reality. Well, so these issues are all enormously important. I was asked to tell you a little bit about the constitutional challenge I filed, and so I'll conclude with that. On the 7th of July, a brutally hot, humid morning in the Mississippi Valley, I stood at the Rush H. Limbaugh Federal Courthouse in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, <laughs> named for his grandfather, who I knew the first 40 years of my life and went to church with, and, and we called Rush, the one you hear on the radio, Rusty, to distinguish him from his father and his grandfather, who were Rush Sr. and Rush Jr., but Mr. Rush practiced law for 80 years in Cape Girardeau, died at 104 and had practiced law till he was 102, so we, and was a towering legal scholar and, and pillar of everything good in constitutional teaching and personal rectitude. In any case, the federal courthouse is named for him, I love to mention it. And we brought a lawsuit, a constitutional challenge that is to be distinguished from the ones brought by the AGs. And God bless Attorney General McCollum, and what is he, up to 20 states that have joined the Florida suit? 22 states that have joined the Florida suit? And Attorney General Cuccinelli, but they are suing in those two suits as states. I was basically barred from doing that because I was the only survivor of the Obama uh, tornado in 2008, and I'm the only Republican out of six constitutional statewide officers in Missouri. But So I decided to take a different legal tack in filing our lawsuit, and I recruited three Missourians who happen to all be females to join me as individual plaintiffs. Now, we distinguish the AG's case legally from ours in the following manner. Theirs is called a facial challenge. That is, they're suing on the face of the constitutional uh, their argument constitutionally is this law is unconstitutional on its face. That is a, the legal scholars tell us, a somewhat higher standard, a significantly higher standard to get that and, and a higher hurdle to, or as Kip Bond would say in our state, a higher stump to jump. The individual plaintiffs in my lawsuit, who I'll tell you about in a second, we're bringing an as applied, not, not a facial challenge, but an as applied. We're saying as this law is applied to us individual citizens of Missouri, it will wreck our health care and wreck our state's finances and therefore is uh, to be struck down. We're making many similar arguments, but it is distinguishable on that basis. It's also distinguishable on the basis that if you have an attorney general or a governor, I was talking to Haley Barber last week, and he said his attorney general wouldn't file, so Haley filed. Haley joined in the state lawsuit. Uh, if you, but if you're in my case 
and your AG or, and governor won't join, then I'm denied the state's purse in bringing this lawsuit. So I'm privately financed. Uh, I'm accepting. I have my tin cup uh, out and healthcareinaction.com. If anybody has 25 or 50 or 100 bucks, you can send me for my uh, 50 to 100 thousand dollar legal bills. Um, I have general counsel at Fox Errant Law Firm that has um, that has won a case in the United States Supreme Court. They they won the big voter ID case. Um, we like our chances in, in where we are in the Eastern District of Missouri because we will go through the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals in St. Louis, arguably the most conservative of the state courts of appeal, I'm sorry, the circuit courts of appeal around the nation. But our three plaintiffs joining me are a 75-year-old lady on Medicare Advantage, Medicare Advantage, a good program, a program that allows her with a multiplicity of health problems to include having survived colon cancer, uh, a quadruple bypass, and congestive, battling congestive heart failure. She says, I need access to good physicians at Washington University Medical School in St. Louis, some of the best on the planet. And since Medicare Advantage is being shut down, since it's a good program, it's of course being eliminated step by step under the new Obamacare, and she says, um, I'm going to be thrown onto Medicaid, fourth-rate delivery of health care, and so if I lived in Florida because of the Gator Aid provision to buy Senator Bill Nelson's vote, you're allowed to keep your Medicare Advantage, but the citizens of 49 other states are denied this good program. What is the rational basis for a distinction like that? There is none. That will not survive a rational basis test, we believe, and can be said to be indisputably a denial of equal protection of the laws guaranteed to all Americans under the 14th Amendment. Um, plaintiff number two is a middle-aged, a 40-something mother, widowed mother of two adopted boys, the younger of whom is autistic. And she says, this law, this law is going to wreck my special needs child's health care. And plaintiff's number Three is a 21-year-old recent college graduate, Samantha Hill, and Samantha Hill says, I'm healthy, I eat right, I exercise, I neither smoke nor drink, I'm 21 years of age, I don't need a policy with all kinds of bells and whistles on it. For instance, I don't need smoking cessation coverage, and I don't need substance abuse counseling coverage. And all I need is a major medical policy with a catastrophic insurance coverage. And yet I'm being forced to buy, with my very limited means as a 21-year-old kid, a policy that is completely unsuited for me, and, and so that's her claim. So ours is unique in bringing those claims, as far as I'm aware, among any of the lawsuits. And as I say, again, God bless uh, the... Uh, Others, the AGs, I hope they succeed and go all the way. And it's entirely possible that under the federal rules of permissive joinder, we will meet somewhere and be joined together. Um, but I wanted you to know about that. And I'll conclude and say that I'm enormously heartened to have a brochure here announcing the Patrick Henry Caucus. You remember uh, every the one size fits all. The school boy and girl used to learn, I hope they still do, the words of his give me liberty or give me death speech. But as stirring as that line was another line. We're arrayed against enormously powerful forces, you know, uh, just like the, the colonists to whom Patrick Henry was speaking, uh, confronting the world's mightiest armed forces. We're we, we in this room are arrayed against the media, the academy, the majorities today in D.C., and with all their power. But Patrick Henry said, the race is not always to the swift nor the battle to the strong. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Let's be all three of those and we will prevail.